welcome to the talk about AI in IntelliJ IDEA. How many of you are using IntelliJ IDEA? Everybody? Uh, okay, cool. Have you tried using an AI assistant in IntelliJ IDEA? Some of you? Nice. Um, my name is uh, Anton. I work at JetBrains as a developer advocate. I'm not a machine learning expert. Like, I know nothing about it. Uh, I build tools, and uh, currently I work with a Kotlin team, like 90% of the time. Uh, so on the language, I sometimes help other teams as well. And my professional background is in Java, and I've been building the tools for Java developers for about 15 years now. Um, I want to talk a little bit, before showing the tool, I want to talk a little bit about the experiment we did recently uh, at JetBrains with the AI Assistant. So we um, recruited uh, a number of people to uh, solve an assignment. It's gone, right? Okay. Now it's better. Okay. So we recruited a few people to uh, solve an assignment. Uh, it's on GitHub. You can check it uh, and see what they had to solve. It's a very small one. And uh, well, basically, they had to build an application, either with AI Assistant or without it. Uh, and there, there were uh, like the, the selection of people who had to do that. So it's a segment. It's not like very junior developers. It's not. Uh, super senior developers, Java developers with three to six uh, years of experience, IntelliJ IDEA users, and we separated them into two groups. The first group would do the assignment with AI Assistant and the other one without the AI Assistant and submit their solutions. And the on the other side, we had reviewers who didn't know how the solution is implemented. Either the person was using AI Assistant or not. So I would blindly just check the assignment and uh, submit my assessment. If the, uh, the, the code uh, is, is good enough, if the structure is there, and so on. So uh, the research wasn't like uh, statistically significant. I mean, we didn't record that many people. But it was interesting to learn uh, how people use this kind of tools and, uh, well, some of the outcomes out, out there. Uh, one of the outcomes that uh, comes uh, imminent, or like you, you would see it immediately, is that those people who use AI assistants um, are more likely to provide more complete solutions. Complete doesn't mean that it, it has a higher quality. So what does it mean? They would uh, submit a code, like the, the, the final solution with some extra artifacts like documentation or tests or even some diagrams and so on. And uh, uh, like you can guess, you can ponder around like why, why is it happening? Like because the uh, assignment is written in a way that it, it doesn't require that. But it's probably the uh, hu humane nature that people uh, when they are not required to do something, they wouldn't do that, but they would if it's easier to do, right? If it's just one click away, then they would provide that. If it's not required and it's hard to do, then they wouldn't spend time on that. The other interesting uh, thing that is more relevant to this talk is uh, how people use the AI assistance. So there are two distinct groups. If you give an assignment to a person, he might you know, identify in one or the other group. The first group would take the assignment, throw into the AI chat window, generate the full solution, and start manually uh, moving uh, the, the solution into the code base. The other group would start implementing their own ideas and using the uh, assistant as a help to implement the solution fully step by step by step. They're very distinct work, like different workflows. So the first group it seems to be uh, laser, maybe, uh, because they want to get everything at once 
And if they are lucky, they will. They will actually get a full solution. Maybe they will have to tailor it a little bit, but uh, not not too much. Uh, but the step-by-step -step, uh, kind of um, workflow appeals to me a little more because then you, you're going to experience a bit more integrated workflow into the tools that you use. Uh, with that, I want to show you a little demo and uh, we're going to pay attention to the details, what is happening there and um, probably learn something. So I have a very small project here, which is based on Spring Boot. Like there is an application, there is a controller. Uh, the controller calls, receives some data and it calls the static method right here. And the static method currently, or th this class, the algorithm, represents a, um, a legacy code. So you wouldn't like just by reading this, I made this ugly on purpose. So you wouldn't say what it is it actually. Can anyone guess what it does? It's not a bubble bubble sort. I, I can like honestly say it's not a bubble sort. But it, it is some algorithm, right? So just by looking at it, you wouldn't tell. And this is a pretty typical situation when working with legacy systems. I mean, it happened to me like 15 years ago already or 10 years ago already when I had to integrate something and I had a snippet of code. I don't know what it, what it is doing. I cannot come up immediately with uh, meaningful names for the variables until I really debug and see the values that are flowing through the algorithm and then I can probably tailor it and, and make it better. But for the AI or for, for the lang uh, large language models, it's just a pattern. It's a pattern of text and it will recognize it immediately. I mean, it has been trained. This algorithm, I have picked it up from the internet. So I just scrambled it and changed the variable names. So in IntelliJ, when you have the AI assistant installed, let me show you for those who don't know, uh, in the plugins, you would have something like this, JetBrains AI assistant. That's a cloud-based service. In the IDE, you have a plugin that integrates with the cloud-based service to submit the request about the code or with some, you know, task that you want to implement. And the service will then decide which language model to use, whether it will go uh, and delegate the call into Google Gemini or into OpenAI API and so on. Or use some uh, local language model on our side to actually implement it, uh, to implement the, the request. Okay, so, and once I have it enabled, I will get this chat window, but, well, th there's a mini, like, there are many chats. Um, and what what is more, what is more important for the workflow that I mentioned earlier, the step-by-step -step workflow, is that um, it, it starts integrating with your, uh, ID actions as you would normally use the ID. Alt enter, everybody knows what alt enter is, right? Perfect. So that's that's your ultimate shortcut kind of in, in IntelliJ. So if you hit alt enter on some element, you will get this AI actions uh, menu. And there you would have some embedded AI actions that we have prepared, but you can also tailor your own ones. So I can ask the AI assistant to Explain the code, either a full class or a method. Let's go with a full class. I hope the internet works. Yeah. So what is happening here when I, when I clicked the action, like pay to the, uh, attention to the details, uh, the, the, this code here actually is not just a plain class. It has some dependencies on some other classes. So there is a graph, object graph in my code that is interconnected somehow, right? When I click the action, the ID will analyze the code, see what are the other dependencies in my code, collect the metadata about my project, and collect the context. What should go into the prompt for the request for the language model? So once we have those dependencies, 
we kind of uh, assemble uh, the, the context of the things in your project that you might not know. So this comes to uh, the, the quality conversation between you and the model. Um, when you're asking the model uh, the question, you can ask, like, what does this code do? And in some uh, context, the, the, the uh, language model can uh, give you some information, but it, will, it might be either very uh, like uh, limited, um, it might not have the full information. And to get the full answer or the full solution, you would need to add more information into the prompt, like step by step, like if you would, would use uh, ChatGPT, for instance, via the web browser, right? When you ask it to gen generate something, it will generate something, but then you might, might not be happy with the solution and you say, oh, but well, it should be defined the other way. So you start chatting with the language model, kind of. Uh, in here, uh, the tri trick is that you might not know what you don't know about your project, but the ID knows. It can analyze it quickly and assemble the context for you. So this is the example here. And well, obviously, the model would respond that, OK, that's a convex hull algorithm. Some, some geometry algorithm, and uh, here's what it does. Sometimes it responds with uh, nice snippets of code with, where it adds the comments, so it even you know, becomes easier to understand what the code does, not just by reading the, the explanation that you could have done on the Wikipedia page or anywhere else in the documentation. So uh, one of the drawbacks in the chat um, interface is that, first of all, it's very easy to start chatting with the model. Like, you, you wouldn't be productive anymore. You start just chatting and uh, uh, tailoring your prompt, kind of, to get a better response. And the other side uh, of it, it's like a side effect, is that uh, you will have to read a lot. Do you read the documentation? Normally not, right? You, you pick the, the, the new framework, start implementing something, it doesn't work. You, you go to Stack Overflow, but you don't go to the documentation. And this is exactly the, the opposite effect. You would have to start reading documentation, making sense of it, just via a different interface. Um, OK, so we know something about the code. Uh, now I have like a confidence that uh, I can do something with the code. Probably I could uh, improve it, because now I'm integrating it into my brand new application. I want to make use of this functionality. Uh, what could I do with it? And in IntelliJ uh, AI Actions, so if I go there again, there's this find problems, suggest refactoring, or start new chat uh, using selection, depending on the, uh, in your intent, what you want to do exactly. Um, you might select or prefer one over the other. Uh, but let's start with find problems and assess what could be the issue with the algorithm if we don't even touch it first, right? So the same thing happens. It assembles the, the, the context and start, starts streaming the, um, the list of possible problems. So it identified for instance, that the, there is a place that returns a null and suggests a better approach to you know to this code. Uh, it checks that there is like finds that there is no no null checks. There is a standard uh, output uh, statement instead of logging. Um, something else. But those are very general uh, assessments, right? It doesn't give you uh, immediately any actions or any suggestions how to fix it. Well, sometimes it does, right? But those are just the code snippets. It's something you have to manually do. And uh, in some cases, it's fine. Sometimes it, it, it can uh, stream your, uh, it will identify some shortcomings in the code and say, well, you probably should completely differently. Uh, in this case, I would go with a suggest refactoring. 
action, which starts a new prompt again. So every time you go through the action, it starts a new prompt. Um, but it has some meta information in that prompt already that we are now refactoring. So I have expressed my intent that I'm now refactoring and I'm going to change the code. And therefore, for us, for integrating the, the chat solution, we actually can now uh, predict that, well, the patch that we generate, you, you might want to integrate that back into the code so we, we can generate some extra widgets for you to uh, work with the code, like see the different apply. In this case, well, the solution is uh, a little bit breaking because it, it, it generated some artifacts, some extra points class here which uh, should be the D class instead, because it's mangled. But it identified that it's a coordinate holder class, so, uh, well, I better to rename it. Uh, let's see what else it did. It changed the name of the T method, right? Uh, the, the D class, it did not extract magic constants. Why, why wouldn't you? Uh, it kept the uh, run method name, it still returns a null, which is, well, you just kind of told me it's a bad practice, why we, why didn't you apply it? Um, well, but it, it extracted a few methods, you know, it, and it seems that, well, it's a little bit more readable. Now, but we are kind of uh, now watching at the solution and we are not completely happy. What we can do here, and we, this is where the cha chat becomes handy is adding more constraints to your initial prompt. So once you have the solution, you can assess it and say, hmm, um, what, what could you do, for instance? Do not return null as a result. Result. What I like, even with bad English, it would recognize that, when, well, you, you can get a result. Let's see what it does. Okay, this time it didn't uh, print the point plus, but it did fix the problem right here, right? So it doesn't return null anymore. Let's wait until uh, the solution is there. Okay, so once, once it's done, I can just click this button and see if I can integrate the uh, the code, the generated result. This time I can, it seems. It will break a little bit because the D class is not renamed. Uh, but well, or let's let's fix it. Let's fix, fix it actually completely. Keep class and method names. So it wouldn't, you know, generate a patch that is hard to integrate back into my code. So it still keeps the D class but it keeps them in the methods and it keeps the original method names. Okay, and, and the extracted method is still there. Uh, so what, what I found uh, when you start experimenting too much, at some point you think that you're incrementally changing the result from the previous uh, response, but it, uh, it's actually not. You're appending to a prompt, so you're just adding more commands to the prompt, and the whole chat, the whole prompt actually goes to the uh, uh, service when you hit the enter. So instead of adding the little commands to the, uh, to the chat, it's actually more so meaningful to change the previous command and add more constraints to the to that command. Uh, otherwise, you will uh, have like the uh, at some point you might have a window like a data window cutoff so that the initial solution will be lost and your your uh, incremental seemingly incremental improvement will be lost as well. So you kind of uh, at the step one you know, when you when you have too many commands in the in the prompt. Um, okay, so. Let's try integrating that, accept it and fix it because it, it will include 
the G class that we don't need. And, and now we have integrated that, so it seems to be compiling and working. Compiling and working, how do you ensure that the change actually works and, and the change is actually correct? Tests, right, but that's a legacy code. We don't have any tests. Right? What, what, what else could we do here? Uh, well, we could generate the tests before actually changing uh, the, the, the code there. But let's talk about tests in, in, in a few minutes. Uh, the, the changes I did here were like, uh, it, it extracted a new method, right? It changed some of the variable names to more meaningful ones, but to be able to integrate the patch, I explicitly asked it not to change the class name and the method names, for instance, right? So that the call sites in my project would be, you know, would not break. Uh, now I would have to rename them manually, it seems, uh, but either just checking what what was the suggested name in the chat, like in the previous step, right? Like calculate orientation, I could do that manually. Or uh, this is the place, this is my favorite place where actually the AI assistant functionality starts blending into the uh, ID actions that you would normally use. So if you use just the re, uh, rename refactoring, it would first show you the technical name, but then it actually, in the background, it does an extra request for this specific element. Can you suggest a better name? And it comes up with the list of you know options that are marked with this icon here. Uh, and I can select one of them. And obviously, it would, it would then work for the other elements and, uh, you know, the class D instead of D it should be coordinate, probably. Uh, let's select all and rename. And maybe this run function should be so, uh, something else instead, like find convex hull. And maybe those local variables should also be different. Leftmost point and maybe we could do something else, right? Um, so incrementally, we kind of changed the code and uh, it looks better, probably more maintainable. One, you know, one uh, drawback is that we don't know if it actually works. Um, of course, we can, we can experiment, test, and, and see how, if it, if it behaves the way we expect it to behave, uh, but, but it's, you know, it's not immediately uh, visible. Let's not roll back, or no, actually I will roll back the, the, the changes for now. This, the controller, coordinate, roll it all back. What, what I also discovered is that you can do almost all the same things, but not going through the chat window. So my theory, my personal theory is that as long as you can stay from the chat, stay away from the chat, uh, it will be, will be beneficial. As soon as you go into the chat, uh, it might you know, drag you in and you start chatting there and you are not productive anymore. So the actions the, uh, such as uh, rename, you know, when you uh, seamlessly start using the functionality within your normal normal workflow, this is where you get the benefit. And as soon as you go into the chat, this is a new workflow for you, right? As a developer, you did not did not use the chat before, and now it's a new workflow where you do some extra movements to get some information from the chat or from the uh, large language model. Uh, so compl things like completions, refactorings, uh, some quick suggestions right inside the editor is what immediately would make you productive with uh, the AI assistant, say. Uh, so how do I do the same refactoring, but now in the editor? Because uh, as you have seen, we do have rename refactoring amendment uh, with the AI assistant, but it's not implemented for everything. And you sometimes 
can change the code in a ways that is not supported by the standard refactorings. Uh, you can select the code and, uh, well, call the uh, special action that is uh, in line code generation, but, but once you have something selected, it actually allows you to modify the selected code right in the editor. And what if I do this, refactor? Seems funny, like make everything good for me. Right. Let's see, <laughs> maybe it will. So it opens the, the diff view and starts rewriting my code. And I see, we'll see how does it change. Calculate turn status, that's an interesting name. Uh, okay, it comes up with better names. It will extract a new method. Nice, let's see if it actually breaks anything. No, it didn't. Nice, so I kind of did the same now, but without going to the chat. So it's, it's a very subjective thing, I think, but for me, it seems that going to the chat is one of the things that uh, take the productivity out of, of all the benefits that this, these tools provide. So for better things, you need to integrate even deeper into the existing functionality of the tool that you are using. Uh, okay, let's talk about tests. That might be fun. Uh, so we don't know if this thing actually works. I'm not going to roll, roll it back now. Uh, I'm even going to change it a little more. So let's let's have a normal class name instead of one uh, letter names. And what we can do, it still returns now. Let's keep it like this. Uh, Alt enter, go to the actions, and there is a prompt for generating unit tests. It's not implemented for all the languages. I mean, it wouldn't appear for Kotlin right now, but uh, essentially you can recreate it. Um, this is a predefined prompt. If I hit it, I will actually not see the embedded messages in the chat that are already predefined for me. Uh, in fact, I will not see the chat. And then you will hit the uh, enter, and uh, again, you will see this diff view and some code being generated. Let's wait uh, until it completes. Uh, so by default, it's going to generate a JUnit test if it doesn't find any dependencies, let's say, on a controller class. Um, then it would probably decide, okay, I want to generate an integration test. So in test generation, you have three decision points when you ask the model to generate, or not me, it's, it's the model that has to make the decisions. Um, three decision points. First of all, the bootstrap logic. Should it be just a unit test? Should it use parameterized test approach? Should it use mocking? Should it be an integration test? Should it use test containers? And so on, right? Basically, it has to decide what kind of skeleton is going to generate it. The second step is to generate the input data, right? The input data is important for code coverage, right? Because we generate the test to figure out if all the branches in the code are actually covered and we get the correct results. And the correct results is the other unknown because how does the model know that the correct result is 42? Probably doesn't. Um, let's see what it generate, generated. So two tests, can we be sure that these are enough, we have to check, right? The model doesn't know anything about the coverage. It doesn't run the code, it just generates it. It, it did not simulate the execution of the code. So uh, there either needs to be an extra step on the service side that now we have generated a test and let's run the test for the code we have, collect the code coverage, it seems to be insufficient, let's generate more. That's a very expensive process. So instead, we can probably tailor our request a little bit and say, ensure that uh, the edge cases are covered. That could be actually part of the default prompt. I don't know, maybe it is. And uh, um, make sure that the 
code coverage is the best, whatever. Uh, so you see, I'm, I'm speculating here. I'm playing dumb right now, and I'm saying to the model that please ensure that the coverage is high, but the model, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure the model cannot, you know, ensure that. But let's see what happens. Maybe it will try harder. Maybe it will be the instruction for the model to actually generate more tests. Okay, so it regenerates the tests. Um, so the result probably will be kind of the same, but you will just have a little more tests with a little bit more combinations of points. Let's, uh, oh, it's still still streaming. No, oh. it tries to ensure everything, right? Okay, yes, accept it. So how many, how many tests do we have? Uh, five instead of two. Uh, what the tests are. So the first one tests with one point, tests with two points. Sometimes I have seen that all the test cases were generated in one method. Uh, it seems that the prompt does not include this instruction that uh, please generate a single test for each use case. This is something I would I would add as well. Uh, so the other one is for three points. The algorithm is actually implemented in a way that it expects at least three points, right? Okay, this is this seems to be like a minimal test case. This one is rather an edge case where you have less. It should be null, right? It should be asserting for null. Uh, then it should be uh, testing if all the same points exist in, in, in the uh, result. And then it will be uh, checking for more points. And now it depends on the algorithm, whether it should be same number or not, because the, the algorithm, what it does, I didn't explain, sorry. It tries to uh, wrap all the points on the surface. And the result of the algorithm is the you know, the perimeter, all the points that surround the other points, right? So the result does not include the points that are inside the, the group. Mm. Okay, uh, so th there might be four. There might be five as well. Uh, here it tells me, okay, if you submit five, you're gonna get four back. So it seems that one of those points was going to be rubbed by the other four, sorry. Uh, and and so on. This test, okay, they are on the same line. It tests if all the points are on the same line. So uh, if I look at it, if I look at the asserting logic, at least, it kind of makes sense. It tries to figure out whether or not the result is null, uh, whether or not the uh, some points can wrap the other point, or they are on the same line. And the assertion seems to be logical. I haven't had a chance to actually play with huge objects yet. This is something I need to experiment with. If the assertions can be generated for you know a result that is a huge object graph, but I think I think it's doable. Uh, so let's run the tests uh, because the model doesn't really know if uh, the, the tests will pass, and sometimes they fail, like now. Yeah, I have 10 minutes, thank you. Uh, so what, what failed? Mm. I'm not gonna fix it, but I just want to see if I can immediately identify what's wrong. Uh, click the difference, let's see. Okay, I don't have like good two string methods right now, but the point I want to make here is that even if the test is seemingly good, you still have to run it and verify if it actually makes sense, right? The model will not execute the code for you. So let's, uh, let's keep it like this. Not gonna spend time fixing. Mm. What else we, we, we could do? Like, uh, just to summarize the test part. Uh, so 
it will generate just a unit test, or maybe if you have some controller in the initial context, it will come up with the integration test for Spring, for instance. Uh, then the coverage, you will have to make sure that actually generated the good inputs and the result is correct, and the good assertions as well, because sometimes you might not get the assertion there uh, in, in the result. And this you can tailor with the extra constraints on the initial prompt. Currently, this prompt in, in that I executed is not exposed for modification, uh, but I think we're going to do that and uh, you know give you the ability to tailor it for your use cases. For instance, you would say, I always want to generate the parameterized tests. Good for you. Uh, the other functionality that you might want to uh, check out, uh, and and you know, uh, the once once you kind of fix the code and so on, you probably want to document something, and la la this is something lazy people do, uh, like me, write the documentation for me. Uh, why why um, why this might be useful? While the text that it generates uh, might be satisfying or might not be satisfying, you read it, you say, "Okay, it seems to be okay. I'm I'm happy with that." Uh, or it might generate something you're completely you, you completely don't like, right? But it's a good start. I mean, people uh, oftentimes have this clean sheet. They're afraid of this clean sheet. They don't know how to start. And one button away, being one button away from the result, makes it easier to actually do this extra step and generate something and work with it. Right? It's the same, kind of the same with uh, empty project. And you just have the requirement and you know throw in the requirement and get some kind of a Canva that you will start tailoring. So that's the other, the first workflow that people sometimes choose. Same with the documentation, same with some other things. But as I mentioned, those who use AI Assistant are more likely to provide this kind of extra artifacts. It doesn't ensure the quality. So there, let's say we have two developers. One of them decided to generate the documentation, and the other one decided to write it. So it's not now up to those personalities whether or not they will put in extra effort to get the quality out. The, uh, the other person who used AI Assistant would be faster probably because he clicked the button, he already has something, and now he can quickly tailor it for the specific uh, result. Uh, OK, what else we have there? Uh, the, the custom prompts. Mm, OK, we, we generated the unit tests. We generated documentation. We uh, were looking into the finding the problems. In fact, w I found uh, a way to apply those suggestions uh, from find problem sections to add the result of that action into the suggest refactoring prompt. So it starts generating uh, like better better readable code in suggest refactoring workflow, but then you would take find problem section, copy the result, and throw it into the uh, suggest refactoring workflow, and it will regenerate with the new requirements, uh, and you will have a patch to apply. When you don't have some kind of um, embedded action, it doesn't mean you cannot do it. You can still implement the functionality just by selecting the code, uh, start chat using the selection, and let's say if I didn't have tests, uh, I would say generate, generate, sorry, yeah, generate tests, and well, it kind of starts the same um, workflow, but it's a pure chatting workflow again. There is no pre-analysis phase. It would not scan the project immediately for the dependencies uh, in for this code that I just submitted. Or actually, it does now. 
it used not to do that. You see, things are changing. Oh, the things I prepared for today were from yesterday, and uh, today it does more. Um, so it was analyzing the test already. Good, nice. And, and I, I can ask it to, to do more things, right? Like in the initial prompt, uh, maybe add more examples and so on. So this way, actually it's possible to uh, tell the model to do some extra things that are not um, predefined for you. Uh, so let's let's go into uh, one one other thing I wanted to show is um, the the prompts library. So once you start uh, adding those snippets of code into the chat and asking to do the same thing, uh, let me select this alt enter AI actions. Add your prompt is the place where you can add more of your own prompts. If you go there, I have some predefined ones from, for myself. So for instance, add SLF4J. Like add logging with SLF4J to this code for all the local variables. I want to lo lock all the lo local variables for this selection. And selection is the element that I will be uh, calling the alt interaction on. Or, uh, sorry. Or um, find problems with the selection that's an old prompt before we actually had the find problems embedded. Uh, or generate unit tests for Kotlin. So we don't have the embedded action uh, for generating tests for with Kotlin, but I have uh, reverse engineered the uh, the prompt for Java and created my own prompt for Kotlin. So this way you can do anything you want, but the, the trick here is that you will not start chatting immediately. At least you will have some embedded action for yourself. Right. Uh, one last thing is exploring the technologies that you don't know. You probably have tried that if you used uh, a, any AI assistant. Like I did some experiments, like trying to implement a functionality with a framework I haven't used, for instance, Micronaut. In, in some cases, I was better off reading the official documentation instead of trying to chat with the, with the AI assistant and generating something out of there uh, because of the uh, knowledge cutoff dates and so on. But for some things uh, that I have completely no experience with, let's say I, I don't have experience with modern UI technologies like web development, this is something I haven't touched for years. Uh, what I did, I was just curious if if I can implement that yesterday. Um, here's a prompt. So I first, the first step I did, I tried asking the model, as I normally do, explain the code, right? We have seen it in the beginning. Uh, the trick here is that I will get all the dependencies into the uh, the prompt. The next step, sorry, I selected the wrong wrong, um, yeah, this one, no, probably it's now in the history, yeah, this one, so it's a longer one, so I, I got the initial code into the prompt, uh, and I asked, can you generate, now I want to represent the uh, results, and I would like to have some kind of UI, uh, for, for my application, what should I do? If you ask it in a very generic way, it will just give you the generic answer. You should just implement something in JavaScript. I don't know how to do that, uh, but there is a trick. If you ask it to, do, uh, to provide the instructions with the phrase step by step, as soon as you have those three words, it actually triggers the model to provide a list of actions you need to do and then the only thing is left for you is to start integrating the result into your application. So here it told me uh, you should modify your controller code like this. Uh, let's let's do that. Let's, let's change it a little bit. Okay. 
too many changes. Sorry for that. We're going to roll back this into D so that we can see the result actually. Yeah. Select all. If I'm lucky, I, I, I will show it to you. Nice. Okay, and now we need mapping here. I'll go with, okay, I, I hope it works like this and fix the other things. So we integrated that and then it provided me with instructions how to implement the UI. Oh good, I copied it. I have, I have no idea what I'm doing, right? I'm copying something into this, like copying from Stack Overflow, basically. Uh, it it worked, but then the result was not uh, like satisfactory to me. Let's say I didn't want to enter all the coordinates for the algorithm one by one. I wanted to paste a JSON file, so I asked for it. Like the input should be a text field that would accept the coordinates data in JSON, right? So it generates a new code for me, but then it didn't work. It was throwing the exceptions. Well, I have no idea, again, what I'm doing. I have no idea how to uh, fix that. This time I was happy. I told it the uh, error message and I said, well, this throws the, the exception. Can you fix it for me? And it, okay, it apologized, of course. Uh, it gave me better better answer. And finally, like after some tweaking, I actually got the code that is working. Uh, maybe we can check how what it looks like. You see, I was specifying only the functionality in the prompt. Uh, I did not specify anything about how it should look like, what kind of technologies should I use, because I don't know them. I don't know what those JavaScript frameworks are today. I'm from the time when I didn't even use jQuery. Um, so okay, we, we have the application running. Uh, is there a browser window? Yeah, there is. Localhost, if it works. Now, solid 90s look, exactly what I want. Uh, for testing, let's say I want some, I want some data from from here, maybe. Oh, that's the assignment, sorry. This is the code I wanted to show, let's see. Yeah, requests. Let's take this JSON and see if it works. And nice, I can now verify if, if uh, the result is actually those red dots right here, right, are actually wrapping the blue dots. Nice. It seems to be I'm I'm gaining the, the the knowledge about the domain, about the legacy code that I haven't brought myself. Uh, so, looking at the code from different angles, trying to implement new functionality on with the technologies I don't know gives me kind of nice exposure. Where I wanted to lead is that again to confirm those two different workflows how people use AI assistants. One is throw in the functionality about things you don't know. You just have the requirements and start doing it one by one. This is what I did with implementing this awesome UI right here. And uh, the other one is when I actually know what I'm doing. Like I know the processes, I have the experience, and the AI assistant would actually help me to do my job faster for like small things like coming up with better names, right? Uh, with this, if you have any questions to me, uh, you know, you can find me on the internet. Twitter is the place. Uh, there are a bunch of uh, slides you can find on my speaker deck account and uh, the examples I showed are uh, in GitHub as well. Mm. Otherwise, you can catch me now and ask more questions uh, if you wish to. And uh, thank you for coming. I hope you will have nice conference.